folks, Dennis Hancock here, UGA Forage Extension Specialist, the Grass Man. Um, here to talk a little bit about some of the things that are going on right now. I know many of you are kind of slogging it out trying to feed hay these days uh, with all the mud that we've been having. Um, just a few quick tips about that and some other kinds of things that we're dealing with and maybe setting the stage for the future as well. So first thing is with feeding hay in the mud, I think one of the big things to do is we need to provide a little bit of structure for those uh, livestock to actually be on. And, um, you know, the ideal situation would be a, a feed pad of some sort with uh, uh, geotextile fabric, crush and run, and, and some uh, an aggregate of some sort there to try to uh, minimize the amount of uh, uh, mud that they're making and, and how deep those legs of those animals are having to go to find traction. So with short of that, I mean, not everybody's going to have that, of course, and a lot of folks are just having to deal with straight feeding out in your pastures. So in that situation, I think one of the key things to do is to identify some, some lots of hay that are low quality, uh, that they're going to be sorting through anyway, and uh, use those kind of first and ever so often, and maybe a couple times a week or something like that to provide uh, some lower quality hay for them to use as bedding, uh, but also to try to um, uh, allow them to uh, find some structure, some footing uh, to, to utilize as well. Um, feed that high quality hay, you know, every other day or two, two days out of three or something like that to try to make sure that they're getting plenty of nutrition. Uh, lots of digestible energy is important at this point, especially uh, when we get into the 20s and, and the, maybe even the teens in some areas. Uh, we need to make sure we're providing plenty of digestible energy there. So real crucial from that standpoint uh, to provide enough condition or enough energy to, to maintain condition and build condition, especially for those that have already started calving and got uh, calves on the ground um, on their mamas. So the next thing to kind of think about is what do we do about those pastures that have been damaged from all this hay feeding? Uh, where do we go from there? And, and what do we do um, in, in response to that to kind of hold the ground a little bit? And I think one of the first things we need to do is decide what we're gonna be doing there and what you're gonna put back there in um, uh, as we wind up the hay feeding season this spring, what are we gonna go back with in those situations? Uh, the key thing to remember is if we don't do anything, all you're going to end up with in those areas is a lot of weeds. So uh, if you don't do uh, your job and make a decision here, you, the weeds are going to make up your mind for you. Um, so let's hold the ground. Uh, that, I think the biggest thing at this point, especially as we're rotating to another spot uh, to do our hay feeding, let's hold the ground with some small grains, uh, use some wheat, maybe some rye, to, uh, to sow across those areas just to stabilize the soil so we don't get erosion. Those areas are gonna be heavy, heavy with nutrients. And as saturated as our soil is at the moment, any kind of rain that we get is gonna be a lot of runoff. So just be aware that uh, we need to take care of uh, making sure we don't end up with a lot of uh, nutrients down in the creeks and, and rivers. Ryegrass works too, but one of the things about ryegrass is it's going to last well into the spring. And the consequence of that is going to be, well, you know, maybe, um, maybe we're going to deal with uh, uh, robbing us of some moisture later on when we get ready to establish. And ryegrass actually does have a little bit of a lelopathy to it as well, especially if we come back with a summer annual or something like that. Uh, so just be aware that could be an issue too. If we're going back with uh, Bermuda grass or Bahia grass, rye grass definitely would not be my choice. Uh, if we're going back with a summer annual, we might be able to get by with rye grass. I'd rather go with the small grains though. Um, in areas of far north Georgia, we could probably use some tall fescue. Um, I really don't like um, uh, sowing tall fescue at this time of the year. It's, it's just not going to do really well. Uh, but if you're concerned about um, you know, competition that might be set up against um, uh, whatever desirable species that you've got coming back, then uh, that fescue might uh, uh, might be a, a good choice. You know, it's it's probably unwise to have the expense of the novel endophyte tall fescues for just sowing over the top of these damaged sites, especially if you're not going to be able to dress them up in any way. Um, and of course, the idea would be to, to smooth it out as, as much as possible, but the reality is we've been so wet 
I don't really think we're going to have that as an opportunity. So uh, um, I like to hold the ground just with some small grains or something like that and then come back a little later in the spring and use some uh, some tillage there to, to even that soil back up and then come back with whatever crop we plan to plant at that point. So one other thing that uh, we might consider, and, and I really think um, clovers really probably fit better where we are trying to fill in pastures that maybe those pastures are damaged in general, not, not necessarily in a hay feeding area, but I think we could go out and broadcast uh, some clover over the top of a lot of our pastures right now. Um, frost seeding of clover is a very effective way of actually getting uh, uh, clover established, particularly more so in North Georgia. We gotta have temperatures that get down pretty reliably into the low 20s and we have to have soil moisture. Well, we got soil moisture in spades right now, but we need to get that temperature down into the low 20s to get the freezing and thawing action of the, of the soil uh, to draw that, that seed down into the ground. So uh, 12 to 15 pounds of red clover to the acre is what you should broadcast out there. Uh, if you're putting white clover out there, I would say do two pounds. Uh, really don't need to go much heavier than that though, especially if you've got any kind of grass out there uh, you don't really want to overwhelm it. I expect this to be a pretty good clover year because we are starting out so wet. Uh, I think we would be in good shape there. Um, I would caution you against using alfalfa. Alfalfa is a great forage crop, but it is not very good from a frost seeding standpoint. Uh, it just isn't going to work quite as well. Uh, and I would say there's probably minimal benefit to a lot of the annual clovers that we use as well. So just something to think about um, as we continue on into the winter. You really don't want to do that past about uh, Valentine's Day or so. Uh, once we get about a couple weeks into February, the weather turns and, and we don't get enough freezing and thawing action usually to draw that into the soil. I've been getting a lot of questions, particularly from South Georgia, about um, nitrogen applications on their, their winter grazing. And yeah, we've been having some real challenges with that this year because of all the rain that we've had. Um, you know, whatever nitrogen was put out there, um, first of all, assuming that you were able to actually get it planted, there's a lot of folks that have not been able to get their winter grazing planted this year. But if you did get it planted and you maybe even were able to fertilize it there soon after planting, one of the challenges is with all the rain that we've had, a lot of that nitrogen has either uh, been utilized or has gone somewhere, probably through the soil profile and right down through the uh, a rooting zone and into the groundwater. Um, unfortunately, that's uh, uh, some of the, you know, one of the challenges that we have with uh, sandy soils in particular, but even with our clay soils, we can run into that problem. And, um, you know, one of the things that we need to consider is, is with all this moisture, um, how do we get that nitrogen built back up? I mean, many of these plantings are already starting to show uh, the chlorosis, the yellowing that is a, uh, associated with nutrient stress like that. How do we improve that situation? Well, we can't do a lot about the rain, but one thing that we can do is whenever the weather does give us a turn for the better, we can go out and, and put some nitrogen out and hopefully stimulate some, some top growth and root growth in trying to get that rooting system to um, to go a little deeper. Uh, right now it's been so wet that roots are probably not wanting to go very deep. But if we can get a little bit of nitrogen out there uh, and some drying to occur, I mean it's actually sun shining at the moment here, uh, but I'm hoping that you know that over the course of the next week, 10 days or so, we might get enough uh, that we could, um, enough sunshine uh, to dry out just a little bit. Then the question becomes what source of nitrogen do we use? any carbon-based nitrogen source. That includes things like animal manures, poultry litter, all of those sorts of things. Um, and even, even urea, by the way, is a carbon-based form of nitrogen. We call it, in, chemically speaking, it's organic. And organic forms of nitrogen have to be broken down by bacteria and enzymes in the soil. And that is a temperature-dependent process. And if we're in cooler temperatures and really anything less than about 40 degrees or so, we're going to really start seeing that slow down. Uh, we really like to see it up in that 50s, uh, 60s, and low 70s 
uh, at this time of the year to really see good benefit from um, the carbon-based forms of nitrogen. Short of that, we can use some nitrate-based nitrogens. Uh, nitrate-based like ammonium nitrate, uh, UAN, urea ammonium nitrate, the liquid nitrogen, 28%, 32%, 30%, whatever. Um, about half of that nitrogen is nitrate-based nitrogen. So, um, well, about half of it comes from ammonium nitrate, I should say. Uh, so we can, we can get a fair amount of uh, uh, readily available nitrogen from that. Um, one other product that we have in, in Georgia, uh, quite a bit of, particularly in the southern two-thirds of the state, is uh, the 19E product from R.W. Griffin kind of a byproduct of another industry and uh, they sell that around at their stores a great product we've evaluated it several times especially the 18 percent product uh, is low in urea uh, i don't think it actually has any urea in it it's uh, calcium uh, calcium nitrate is the nitrogen form there it is very readily available uh, but they they would need to probably apply that unless your spray rig is actually set up to put it on. Now, if you have a set up to do that with dribbler nozzles and, and that sort of thing to be able to handle that more viscous type of material, um, then that would work too. But um, hopefully these give you some kind of tips to uh, work with uh, as we continue into the into the winter. We're hoping for a, a quick end to the winter. We're just uh, ready for spring. I know you all too. Um, and hopefully 2019 won't be nearly as wet and soggy as uh, 2018 was. But uh, hopefully this will help you. If you've got additional questions, come see us on our website there at georgiaforages.com. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter as well. And uh, with that, I'll uh, see you on down the road.